Hello everyone, this is the Meek Street Church of Christ, and we're here today, we're coming this July the 26th, and we're here in the, again in the year of the pandemic, and we are once again not back in the building. We'd like to be here this morning, but for reasons because of the governor's order and so forth, and we do have a lot of people sick and are out of town, so we're not meeting today and next Sunday, and so we want to think about and have prayers for those who are affected by this. We have actually had some in the congregation affected and have to be quarantined because of this coronavirus. So it kind of hits home to us when all that kind of happens to us in that way. But I want to talk about God's word this morning. As we look at God's word and we want to talk about the things that be of God of an eternal nature. As God wants us to do each and every first day of the week. The Bible teaches us and directs us to do so. And even in times like this, we still have to focus on and keep our uh, priorities where they are in God's word today. We're going to talk about a very important uh, subject, a man from the New Testament. He's one of the last of the prophets of the, Old Test of the Old Testament going into the New Testament. And we'll look at lessons from a great man, John the Baptist. It's actually in the four Gospels that we'll look at the life of John the Baptist. We'll look at several passages that talk about this great and wonderful man. And we'll look at our lesson text. It's Matthew chapter 11, verses 7 through 11. Let's look at, see what the Bible says concerning this great man. In verse 7, the Bible says, As these men were going away, Jesus began to speak the crowd, to the crowds about John. What did you go out into the wilderness to see? A reed shaken by the wind? But what did you go out to see? A man dressed in soft clothing? Those who wear soft clothing are in king's palaces. But what did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes, I tell you, and one is, who is more than a prophet. And the Bible goes on, verse 10. This is the one about whom is written. Behold, I send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way before you. This is actually a prophecy about who it was would be the forerunner or the one that would go and prepare for the Messiah, Jesus Christ, and would announce to people his coming and go and do this great important work that God had planned even from long ago. In verse 11, the Bible goes on to say, Truly I say to you, among those born of women, there has not arisen anyone greater than John the Baptist, yet the one who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. And this is one of the things where we get that this is talking about John as a great man. That's where we get our a lesson text or a title of our lesson, how that John was a great man. And he had a lot of, you might say, big shoes to fill. As we know, that Elijah was one of the great prophets of the Old Testament, and John the Baptist was in the likeness of Elijah. And so we can understand who it is by looking at Elijah's life, how he was. There's a lot of similarities between him and Elijah as we look at John the Baptist's life in regard to that. Let's look at some of the things about John's character and his traits. One of the things we see uh, really in the book of the Gospels, the Gospel of Matthew, is the fact that he lived a simple life in Matthew chapter 3 beginning with verse 3. The Bible says when Herod, actually in verse 3, it says, for this is the one who referred to by Isaiah the prophet. You back up verse 1 and 2. It says, now in those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea, saying, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is he who is the one referred by Isaiah the prophet, when he said, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, make ready the way of the Lord, make his path straight. And that's exactly what we see in John the Baptist. He was one who was a simple person. Verse 4 even tells us how John himself had a garment of camel's hair and a leather belt around his waist, and his food was locusts and wild honey. As we know that he lived in the wilderness. In other words, he lived where places where it was desert, deserted area, and how he lived off the land. This locust and wild honey was his diet, and all that referred to his lifestyle and so forth. He wasn't this, this soft man that was wearing a clothing that would be in, in king's palaces, nor was he a reed shaken in the wind. We'll see about that in his message, and we'll definitely understand what that means when it comes to how John the Baptist spoke and the things that he said as not being, un, he was not compromising, he was uncompromising in the way that he spoke. 
And so he would live a simple life. He was there out in the wilderness with God and, and the quietness of all that, not in the hustle bustle. Many times we let our affluence and our materialism get in the way of our service to God. And that can be an indictment upon us because we let that get in the way. But John wasn't like that. He was a simple man with a simple message because it was the inspired word of God, his message. But also, John was a humble man. He lived a life of humility in John chapter 1, 19 to 21. Again, we go to the book of John. We're going to go back and forth just a little bit in our studies about different verses, and you'll see the connection when we get there. In John chapter 1, verse 19, here the Bible tells us, this is the testimony of John when the Jews sent to him priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, who are you? And he confessed and did not deny, but confessed, I am not the Christ. They asked him, what then? Are you Elijah? And he said, I am not. Are you the prophet? And he answered, no. So all that points to his humility. He's saying, I'm not the one you're looking for who's the Messiah. And he also says, I'm not literally Elijah, but he was in the likeness. He became in the spirit of Elijah. So technically he did not say anything wrong when he said, no, I'm not Elijah, as he was that one who was not literally, his name was John, John the Baptist. And we go to chapter 3 and verses 25 to 30. Again, we see this humility from this man, John the Baptist. He knew his place. That's one of the things all of us, as, as we do our role in the service of God, as speakers, as those who talk about the things of God, we need to know our place when it comes to what we do as God's people today. And John knew that. In verse 25, the Bible says, Therefore there arose a discussion on the part of John's disciples with a Jew about purification. And they came to John and said to him, Rabbi, he was with, the, with you beyond the Jordan, to whom you have testified. Behold, he is baptizing, and all are coming to him. Here they were saying, Jesus, the very one you baptized, he's getting everybody. We're losing our prominence, in other words. Everybody is going to them, going to Jesus and his disciples, and he's baptizing them. You know, John and Jesus both baptized, said, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. It was about to come. And so all of this shows us John realized his place. Look what John says. The Bible goes on to say in verse 26, and they came to John and said all that to him. Verse 27, John answered and said, a man can receive nothing unless it has been given him from heaven. You yourselves are witnesses, or my witnesses, that I've said, I am not the Christ, but I have been sent of or ahead of him. He who is the bride has the bride is the bridegroom. But the friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him rejoices greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. So this joy of mine has been made full. He must increase, but I must decrease. And guess he knew his place. He knew that he was calls himself the friend of the bridegroom. If you go to a wedding, you have what we call sometimes the best man, and he's the one who's not in the spotlight today. He is the one who gives the bride away, or actually the father does that, but he's the best man, and he knows that he's part. He's not the one that's going to get married that day. He's not the one that has the bride, in other words. Spotlight is all on the groom, and so John knew his place. That's a good illustration to show us that he knew his place. He was the friend of the bridegroom. Now we turn to John chapter 1 and verse 35 and verse 37. Again, we're jumping back and forth, but we see some of the things that are said here, and as, as they, in context, are talking about humility and John realizing his place. Verse 35, after he has baptized Jesus, after the Spirit of the Lord came upon Jesus and all that, John fulfilled his role in baptizing Jesus. Verse 35, again, the next day John was standing with two of his disciples, and he looked at Jesus as he walked and said, Behold, the Lamb of God. The two disciples heard him speak, and they followed Jesus. Now, what's the point about that? Here is Jesus is taking away John's disciples. Or he takes two away from John. And John goes, I'm giving these disciples to Jesus. And he knew his place. All that shows us. He understood that I'm not the important one, but the one who is really important is the Messiah, Jesus, the Son of God, as it would be, who would say, take and, and takes away the sins of the world. 
And in chapter 4 of John, in the handout I'll put Matthew 4, but it's John 4, verse 1. Therefore, when the, the Lord knew that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus was making and baptizing more disciples than John, that's why he left and he was not baptized, but he, he left that. He realized, oh, everybody's going and they're listening to what I have to say. And they understood Jesus is starting to gather a following. So that's exactly what it must be. You know, John was content to let Jesus have his place. You know, he simply stood back. He did it. He denounced the Jesus, and then he stepped back. He slipped back into the, out of the way of the spotlight. That's exactly what we should do. Oftentimes, there are people who announce, and they will announce others are going to actually going to perform and such, and they introduce this person. That's the way John looked at himself as, I'm the introduction. I'm the introducer of Jesus. And he was content to be a servant, not the star, not to be the one everybody comes to and everybody looks at. We all need that kind of humility today. They realize like John, that it's not about us. And he was devoted to the work, not honor for himself. That's exactly what we all need to do. He simply announced Jesus and he slipped into the background, as the Bible would tell us. That's exactly what we all need to do when it comes to having a humility before God and before men. And then we see the openness of John the Baptist. In Matthew chapter 11, going back to Matthew 11, we find this is when John was in prison. And the Bible tells us there that he had some doubts. You know, it's one of the things about the people of God. Sometimes we express those doubts and we see that openness, to be able to have these kind of doubts and express them. The Bible tells us in verse 2, Now when John, while in prison, heard of the works of Christ, he sent word by his disciples. He said to him, are you the expected one or shall we look for someone else? And the Bible tells us that's when he was showing those kind of doubts. You know, it's something we understand faith is something that can be shaken, especially in times of suffering. And that's exactly what John was going through when he was in the prison. And just like kind of reminds us of Job, how he expressed his doubts, his openness about his faith. And, and one thing that about that is it helps us to develop our faith when we work through those and get through those kind of things, you know, God didn't cast him away. God didn't cast away John the Baptist because he had doubts. Actually, Jesus assured him, gave him stronger faith. The Bible tells us in verse 4 that Jesus answered and said to them, Go and report to John what you hear and see. The blind receive sight and the lame walk. The lepers are cleansed and the deaf hear. The dead are raised up and the poor have the gospel preached to them. And blessed is he who does not take offense at me. And we see John, that was enough. John simply would have the words of Jesus, his miracles, not to say yes or no answer, but he gave him, in a sense, the right answer, as that this was what the Messiah was going to do and was going to do all the things that Jesus was doing. And so that openness, you know, sometimes when we, when leaders have weaknesses, it's easier to follow that person than someone else that doesn't have any types of weakness. We often think about Elijah. Again, Elijah was a man of like passions, such as you and I, as James tells us. And he's just like us. He's just a common uh, man just like us, or a person, a human just like us. There are times when we are, our faith may be weakened because of suffering. But as long as we don't lose our faith, God will still be with us through all the things that we suffer in this life. Then there's the idea, uh, idea of John's forthrightness. And I really think about this in Matthew chapter 3, verse 7. Here we look back to Matthew 3, how that when he saw many of the Pharisees and the Sadducees coming for baptism, he said to them, you brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? And here he's really telling us in no uncertain terms what these people really were. He calls them a brood of vipers. He was very straightforward and forthright about this. You now, John pointed out these are like snakes. These men are coming here. They're not really coming here for the right reason. They weren't coming to be baptized. They rejected the baptism of John. But yet he pointed out sin. And he pointed out the sins, even of all the people, when it comes to all the, the national sins of Israel, trying to get them to come back to repentance. That's what repentance and that's kind of preaching will get people to do is to come back to where they need to be. And we need to be straight on with people and say what needs to be said. He was an honest man when it comes to he was a man of integrity when it comes to how he spoke to others. He said what was needed to the crowds 
and did not compromise. He was this reed that was not shaking the wind. In other words, he wasn't blowing around, going which way and the other, but he was firm. He was strong in what he was saying. That's what we need today. We need bold preaching. We need people who will stand for the faith like John the Baptist and Elijah the prophet. And how that's, that's part of what we do is pointing out sin and helping others to see the way that God wants us to live and all of us need to live. And even it was an example to, to others, all example to all leaders about this, about pointing out sin. But even more so was his example of us in face-to-face -face encounters with others. In Matthew chapter 14, it was, it's easy sometimes to talk to people when there's great crowds. But even when it's one-on-one, -on -one, and especially if it's someone like a king, like Herod was. In Matthew chapter 14, here beginning with verse 3, the Bible tells us when Herod, for when Herod had arrested John, he bound him and put him in prison because of Herodias, the wife of his brother Philip. For John had been saying to him, it is not lawful for you to have her. Now he basically told him that this is wrong, what you are doing this lifestyle that you have of taking your brother Philip's wife, which living in adultery, that idea of, of adultery there. God said in one of the Ten Commandments, they were not to commit adultery. And this is exactly what was going on. He did not belong to her. It was unlawful for him to have her. So therefore, it's unlawful for him to keep her. And so he's pointing out this type of sin. And that's really sometimes one of the hardest things to do because you think about the prominence of a king. You have to stand up and say something who could arrest you and put you in prison. That's exactly what got him into prison. And his forthrightness, his, his sta standing for the truth, as he would say exactly what needed to be said. And he taught the things about this, about the kind of leaders we need to have. That we're not to seek to please men. Galatians chapter 1, verse 10, Paul himself would even say that if I seek to please men, I should not be the servant of Christ if I do that. And so we're not to look at the prominence of someone or even look at our friends. You know, sometimes we may be tempted because of our friends to say, well, I'm not going to say what the truth is. You know, John was forthright, was bold, and spoke what needed to be said at the time it needed to be said. So that's what got him in trouble, you might say, in that regard. And so that's one of the things we remember him about is that we often call these fire and brimstone preachers the idea of straightforward and even very understandable. That's one of the things bold preaching is. It's understandable, and it's also very straightforward. It's clear to the point. No beating around the bush. You know, John wasn't one of these preachers that, well, I don't know if it's a sin or not, and it, it might be wrong in some ways. You know, John told him exactly what it was. He had convictions, and that's why we need to be forthright in our convictions when it comes to what sin is and getting people back to the right way of service to God. Now we come to the part we talk about John's teachings. And here, John had some messages about repentance. As we know, he was bold in his, his preaching, his teaching. But what was his message? You know, there's not about, not a lot of sermons that are talked about what John the Baptist said. We are given some of the words, but we like to have a lot more. We have a lot of the sermons of Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount, which is the longest recorded sermon, Matthew chapters 5, 6, and 7. But when it comes to John the Baptist, we have some very simple statements that are said by John. His message, though, was very clear. It was very to the point, wasn't it? In Matthew chapter 3, going back to Matthew 3, here again, the Bible tells in those days came John the Baptist preaching. What did he preach? He was saying, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And that's very plain and simple, isn't it? They were waiting for a kingdom. And now John says, repent. And we all know what repentance means. It means a change of mind that leads to a changed life and reform in our lives. When a person changes his mind about stealing, he no longer does that as a desire to go out and steal cars or, or items or purses and things like that, or jewelry out of somebody's houses and things like that. He changes his mind about sin and doesn't practice that anymore. That's exactly what we need when a person changes and repents about lying and telling lies. They say, well, I'm going to speak the truth from now on. I've committed my ways in repentance to only saying what is true, what's right, and is proper for us. And that's what we do when we repent. John's message was one of getting people away from the ways of doing evil things. You know, not 400 years of silence 
they had times when they were not, they were faithful to God, but there are also times when they were unfaithful to God. And the times their leaders, they needed to hear those words of repentance. The leaders, the Jewish leaders, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, they were corrupt in a lot of ways. They needed to change. Jesus in Matthew 23 talks about all the changes they needed to make about some of the things. They were hypocrites, blind guides, and they were shutting up the key to the kingdom of God in some respects because people weren't able to go into the kingdom of God in that preparatory sense, I should say. In the sense, the kingdom was going to be established and people need to go into that kingdom through the teachings of Jesus. And they would do that. On the day of Pentecost, they would follow the ways of Jesus into that kingdom. And so that these Jews, who were the ones who can pass land and sea to make one proselyte of these Gentiles and make him twofold the child of the devil because of their traditions, because of all the things they do, the washing of pots and things like that. And they would not do really what God wanted them to do. They actually made the outside look so good, but yet the inside, their hearts was full of dead men's bones, as the Bible tells us. And so they needed to repent. They needed to come back to God's ways. God's ways is a life of purity. And that's exactly what John was trying to get them to do. No longer live in adultery, no longer live a life of sin and living all the things in fornication and involved in drug use that we would say today. Those things were not a part of that first century, but they are part of our life today. Our message about repentance is the command of God hasn't changed, has it? And so we have to teach people again, John's message about repentance for the kingdom of heaven is at hand has to be changed in some respects because the kingdom is now here. Now we have seen the kingdom established and Jesus came to set up this kingdom. And he did on the day of Pentecost. There the kingdom was established and men can enter that kingdom today and be a part of that system of faith today. But not only did he teach repentance, but he also taught reform. In Matthew chapter 3, verse 8, as the Bible tells us that they need to see this in their lives. You know what reform, the idea of reform is you need to rechange. You make yourself the different person that we talked about here. In Matthew 3, verse 8, he talks about in verse 7, about how he taught these brood of vipers who warns you to flee from the wrath to come. And in verse 8, he says, but, he says, therefore, bear fruit in keeping with repentance. That's what you need to do. And the contrast is, don't be the snakes anymore. You reform your life and bring forth fruit, meat for repentance. But also, they need to also restore their lives to God. And this is one of the things that we see in Luke chapter 1, verse 17. You know, Zacharias was told, he's prophesied, that this would exactly happen. How that John the Baptist would get people to be restored. The time of restoration was coming at hand. That he, people would come back to God in this way. In John, Luke chapter 1, verse 17, the Bible says, Zechariah said, actually verse 17 says, it is he who will go as the forerunner before him in the spirit of the power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers back to the children and the disobedient to the attitude of the righteous so as to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. He would get these people to come back to the way that they need to be. Like, kind of like what I, like Isaiah would, and Jeremiah were trying to get the people back to the, the ways, the old paths. And Jeremiah said in chapter 6, return back to the old ways and get back to a life of what God wanted them to have. God wanted them to be restored. And that's really what he said. He'd make the crooked paths. He'd go out and make the crooked paths straight. He'd bring low the mountains and so forth. And that's really a symbolic language that he would make things crooked back straight again. And that's what you do when you restore something, you get it back to the way it should be. Something that's not supposed to be crooked, it'll be made straight again. And so God, through John the Baptist, praying the hearts of people in that way. Was John's message a negative message? In Matthew chapter 3, verse 7, down to verse 12, as we read in Matthew 3, some of the things that Matthew says about him, we can think of this as being negative. If you think about it, often people say, well, I don't like negative preaching. Well, this idea of preaching is you need to take things out of your life and change. God calls us, though, to make changes. You know, we often like the positive preaching where everything's encouraging, and we say, you'll stand firm and talk about love and things like that, and we think about that. 
There are both negative and positive commands that God gives us. We take away, we put in the life that we, God needs, wants us to live. In Matthew chapter 3, begins verse 7. The Bible says, When he saw me, the Pharisees and Sadducees coming for baptism, he said to them, You brood of vipers, who warns you to flee from the wrath to come? Therefore bring fruits in keeping with repentance. And do not suppose that you can say to yourselves, We have Abraham to our father. For I say to you that from these stones, God is able to raise up children to Abraham. In other words, don't think that just because you are the descendants of Abraham, that you have your ticket punched, that everything's all right because, well, because of who we are. No, it's not who we are. It's about what we have become. God looks at our hearts, what we have are, in a sense, our actions and our deeds. That's why he told them to bring forth fruits, meat for repentance. And, you know, negative preaching will do that. It will bring us to ways that we realize we can't stay the way we are if we're doing bad things. We have to come to God through his way of service. Now, verse 10, he talks about, it says here, the ax is already laid at the root of the trees. Therefore, every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. You know, sometimes people like, I love these lessons about love and forgiveness and, and God's mercy and compassion. And I love those sermons too. You know, we also have to take the lessons he talks about the fire and, and the brimstone and also the idea of we're not faithful, we're going to be cut off. And that's exactly what he talks about here. The ax is laid at the root. In other words, judgment is coming. The Bible tells us that's exactly, he talks about things like heaven and hell and judgment where sin is not ignored. That's the kind of sometimes people call negative preaching. And where John the Baptist in verse 10 talks about things that were cut down and burned off. He's talking about, actually talking about people here. We don't think about, don't get lost in this idea of cutting trees down, this axe figure, this illustration, or this metaphor, however you look at it. He's talking about the time if you don't change, God's going to cut you off, and you're not going to be in salvation if that is the case. Don't think of yourselves as simply being Jews that are living in Jerusalem that were automatically saved. No, not, also, we can't think about in our age, the idea if we're in the church building, we're in the church of Christ, that we're automatically going to be saved because that's not the case. If we're not living right, you know, sometimes say, well, there's a lot of hypocrites in the church, and there may very well be people who are not saved because of what John's saying here, because they've never made the change. You know, it takes more than simply just being in the church building. You know, you might say, we, just because we're in the garage, we, we cannot say we're a car because of that. There's illustrations that talk about that. You know, we must be a Christian, and it needs to show in our lives. That's really what John's saying, by bringing forth fruits, meat for repentance in that way. And some might look at this again, as I said, as negative preaching, or is it simply truth preaching, the kind of preaching that we need to hear today. I believe Paul told Timothy back in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 2 through 4, here he said some words about what we preach in the New Testament, how preachers need to say the words that they say even today. The Bible tells us in verse 2, preach the word, be ready in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with great patience and instruction. For the time will come when they will endure sound doctrine, but wanting to have their ears tickled, they will accumulate for themselves teachers in accordance to their own desires. That's one of the sad things about this life is that many people don't want the truth really preached to them in this way. They, I want all the positive things. Preach to us smooth words, in other words. And he said, Timothy, that's not the way you do this. Verse 4 says, And will turn away their ears from the truth and be turned aside to miss. Some who cannot endure sound doctrine will do that. They will absolutely go the wrong way. That's why many pulpits are filled with preachers who want to have feel-good sermons and things like that. We don't need that in the church. We need churches and preachers to be bold in the stance for truth and live like John the Baptist, be this one who said, if you don't live right, you're not going to be saved. That's exactly what John the Baptist said to those. And we talk about his, his teaching, his teaching traits, how effective it was. It really, it really depends on how you look at the word effective. Some might think, well, John, you're not very effective because all the Jews didn't come to you. Yet we see the ones who would come to him, not the ones that wanted to have their ears tickled, but the ones who truly wanted salvation. It wasn't the religious leaders. But in Matthew chapter 3, verse 5 and 6, going back to Matthew 3 again, 
We keep going back to this particular reading of, of Matthew. Verse 5 6 says, Then Jerusalem was going out to him, and all Judea and all the district around the Jordan. And the Bible tells them they were being baptized by him in the Jordan River as they confessed their sins. You see how there's great responses to his preaching. He saw a lot of people. You think about all the region. It doesn't give us a number, but there was a lot of people who came and listened to John. They were waiting, weren't they? Like I said, after the 400 years of silence, John the Baptist comes along, and the people were hungering and thirsting after God's word once again, after that famine of God's word was over with John the Baptist. In Luke chapter 7, again, we read how that some, not all, would come to him. In Luke chapter 7, we see it here in verse 29. The Bible says, when all the people and the tax collectors heard this, they acknowledged God's justice having been baptized with the baptism of John. Notice what it says in verse 30. It says in verse 30, but the Pharisees and lawyers rejected God's purpose for themselves, not having been baptized by John. You look at the old King James, they rejected the counsel of God against themselves by not being baptized by John. So there were some who would not come to him, even if they, they had to admit, you know, Jesus once told them the baptism of John wasn't from heaven or was it from men. And they couldn't say, they wouldn't say. They basically said well, they would incriminate themselves because Jesus would say, if he was from heaven, why didn't you go and be baptized by John? They, did, they neglected that, didn't they? But yet the Bible says they did not say. We, we simply can't answer. They dodged the question. That ought to answer they should have given that, that John the Baptist was preaching from heaven. He had heaven's authority behind what he was saying. And so that makes him effective in that way. And we think about some of the enduring retreats. I'm, before I get into that, you know, there are some of the things that we need to have. A lot of times people go back up to this idea of effectiveness. What does it take to really be effective? It takes someone who is preaching the whole counsel of God, who's saying what needs to be said, and he doesn't fear the people and what they will say, whether they turn away or they believe. That's the way Jesus taught, isn't it? The Bible tells us when, when he taught some hard things in John chapter 6, the people walk no more with him because of that. And because of that, he saw many disciples. He turned to the twelve and said, will you also go away? Now, he was effective. You know, the crowds may not have been listening at that point, but yet Jesus' ministry when he gets people to listen to him the right way, doing the right things, that's effective because it's, God says his word will not go back to him void. And that's exactly with us. If we are effective, when we speak the words of God, and even if everybody rejects it, still we're effective because God's will is done in that regard. Let's look at some of the enduring traits, some of the way things that got him in trouble. Here we get into the last part of John's life. In Matthew chapter 14, the Bible speaks about here where he gets in trouble with, with Herod and, and all that happens with the, as I mentioned, Herod and Herodias and such. They'd had a, a bad marriage in, in some regard. And in verses 1 through 12, let's read this, this passage, all 12 verses. The Bible says, at that time, Herod the Tetrarch heard the news about Jesus. He said to his servants, this is John the Baptist. He has risen from the dead. And that is why miraculous powers are wor at work in him. For when Herod had arrested John, he bound him and put him in prison because of Herodias, the wife of his brother Philip. For John had been saying to him, it is not lawful for you to have her. Although Herod wanted to put him to death, he feared the crowd because they regarded John as a prophet. And when Herod's birthday came, the daughter of Herodias danced before them and pleased Herod so much that he promised with an oath. Notice that, with an oath to give her whatever she asked. Having been prompted by her mother, she said, give me here on a platter the head of John the Baptist. Now, they could have had anything they wanted, up to half his king and so forth. But yet, you know, you, whatever it is, I'll give it to you. If they, wanted, they wanted revenge, didn't they? They wanted John the Baptist's head on a platter. They go on to say, verse 9, although he was grieved, the king commanded it to be given because of his oaths and because of his dinner guests. He didn't want to be embarrassed having to turn that down. He simply said, I'll just give you what you want because of all that, because of my oath and such. Verse 10, he sent and had John beheaded in the prison. 
and his head was brought on the platter and given to the girl, and she brought it to her mother. You imagine such a scene. Here, John the Baptist's head is on a platter, and they're proud to have it there because finally they had revenge for someone who had, had said it's not lawful for you to have her as your wife. Evidently, she was extremely ill at John the Baptist, and she thought to her revenge, at least she thought she did. And you think about that, how that's something that no one should ever treat someone that way. But here the Bible tells us that's exactly what happened here on this particular time. And verse 12 tells us, his disciples came and took away the body and buried it, and they went and reported to Jesus. And that's when we find that Jesus recluded off to a place, and then he talks about John and how great John was, kind of a eulogy about John. John was a great man. No one born of woman was greater than John the Baptist. He stood to the end. His enduring traits was that he preached even though it cost him. It cost him his life because of what he said there. You know, that's exactly what happens sometimes. He was silenced because of his message. You know, oftentimes when people don't like the message, they will say, kill the messenger. That happened to the Old Testament prophets. People like Isaiah and Jeremiah and Ezekiel and others, they, they were killed. The Bible, even Jesus would say, which one of the prophets did your fathers not kill? And so he's basically saying, your fathers killed all the prophets that came and preached messages to them of repentance. And yet, that's exactly what happens here. Instead of repenting, instead of doing the right thing and separating and getting away and giving his wife back to Philip, his brother Philip's wife, Herodias, he simply said, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to stay with her, and we're not going to do that. And it caused her to have this ill will toward John the Baptist. But, you know, the question comes, inevitably, did this, this death of John change the message that John said, it's not lawful for you to have her? Did it change the truth of that statement? You know, we think about the time in the Old Testament, Jeremiah chapter 36 and verse 23. Here, Isaiah, actually Jeremiah, was told to go and preach some things and prophesy doom and gloom to the house of God because of the things they were doing. They, they did not repent. They were not doing right. And yet God wanted to warn them, if you don't repent, all this is going to happen to you. And the Bible says you give the scroll, first, first few couple of verses in, in 36 tells us that Jeremiah was told to go and take this to Barak and, and make this scroll and give it to the king. Barak would give it to the king. The Bible tells us in verse 23, when, when Jehu had read three or four columns, the king cut it with a scribe's knife and threw it into the fire that was in the brazier until all the scroll was consumed in the fire that was in the brazier. You know what happened there? This man got upset because of the message. He didn't kill the messenger. Oftentimes they would kill the messenger, and then they would do that later on. But here he gets rid of the message. And you know, did it change the message? Basically, God made him another scroll, Jeremiah another scroll, and they gave it to the king again, and, and, and so that message didn't go away. Just because we don't like the message, many times we may want the message to go away. That's exactly what happened to John. John did exactly what he needed. He was one who's persecuted for righteousness' sake. He did his course. He, he lived a life of purity and lived for the Lord Jesus Christ in that regard. He did the message that, of what God would say in the prophets that God's people need to hear. Oftentimes when one voice is silenced, other voices need to come up and take its place. And that's exactly what happened. As people of God would stand up and, and continue to say the things that need to be said. And we honor the life of this man, John the Baptist, today. We think about some of the things he accomplished. You know, he was a servant, not a star. And he was devoted to the work, not honor. And yet he was one who we can honor today by saying he did the work of God and accomplished his mission as the forerunner of Christ and a great example to us of what God wants in you and I today as his people today. Hope you have paid a good attention lesson today. Hope it's been beneficial to you in some way that we can look and see how God wants us to be and to live in this life and look at the word of God and say, you know what, John the Baptist preached, I need to preach. And it comes to the way that he preached of repentance and life for God and the New Testament age. 
As we know, John died in the Old Testament before the New Testament was established. But yet he was a great man. He was a great man of God who did God's will. And that's an example to us. We need to do God's will today and live for the Lord Jesus Christ. If we can help you to do that, why don't you reach out to us and let's say, I want to become a child of God, a child of Jesus Christ and serve us to him by faith, repentance, confession of your faith in Jesus Christ and baptism into Christ to make you a New Testament Christian today. You can do that. We can help you do that in some way. We'd be happy to help and come to your house even and help you to obey the gospel and worship and serve God together in his kingdom today. Thank you very much for your kind attention to the lesson of our hour today. We'd like to be back in the building again, but that'll be soon. Soon enough, we'll be back in the service of God at the building once again. Thank you very much.